Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again on a beautiful spring afternoon. And uh, for those of you who uh, have come from a distance, we just want to welcome you and appreciate so much that uh, you put forth the effort to come in for these tapings. For those of you out in television, again, we just thank you for inviting us into your living room or wherever you happen to be watching the program. And uh, I know many of you have your first cup of coffee with us and uh, start your day. But whatever, we thank you for your prayers, we thank you for your interest, for your financial help, and uh, how we thank the Lord for lives that have been touched through our simple teaching of the Word. Again, we always like to remind for sake of new listeners that we're just an informal Bible study. We're not associated with any group. We are totally independent except for the Lord. And uh, we just trust that we can prove from the Scriptures that uh, we're not coming out of the woodwork, as we say. Uh, oh, I wanted to remind our television audience, if you are not getting our quarterly newsletter and you would like to, Drop us a note. Quite a few of you have let Matt know on our email. And uh, get on our mailing list, and you can get our quarterly newsletter free of charge. And uh, if you want to order the present day program, order for book number 50. That means there's 12 programs to a book. So when 50 is finished, we'll have over 600 programs done. So we've covered a lot of territory. All right, this is a Bible study, and we're going to go right back where we left off at the end of our last program, which is Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, we were in verse 19. Jerry's got 20 on the board, but I'm going to jump in at verse 19 a little bit because I didn't feel that I'd finished it completely. Where, remember, we're talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. And uh, always remember, too, that the book of Hebrews is written primarily to Hebrews, to Jewish people. Not that we can't learn from it. There's a lot in here that is so apropos even for us in the age of grace. But whatever, these Hebrew people remember, like the Jerusalem church, and I don't think this was written to the Jerusalem church, another one like it, but that the Jerusalem church and these other Jewish congregations that were scattered throughout the Roman Empire had embraced Jesus as their Messiah. They had grasped that much, but they were still keeping the law. They were still hanging on to so many of the tenets of Judaism. And that's so obvious, as you saw in the study of Acts that's been on the daily program, how that Peter said, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Well, why not? Because he was a good law-keeping Jew. And when he got to the house, you remember, of Cornelius, he hedged and he said, now you know. It's unlawful for me, a Jew, to keep company with him of another nation. Well, why? That was all part of Judaism. And then when you go on over into Acts chapter 22, when Paul is rehearsing his conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul makes the statement that Ananias, a devout man according to the law. Well, you see, none of those believers in Jesus as the Messiah had yet severed themselves from that part of Judaism, which was law-keeping. And so this is what the whole book of Hebrews is really all about, is to convince these Jewish believers now to move away, cut the apron strings to Judaism, not to just throw it away as trash, no way. It's the very foundations of everything that has come on up through, even into Paul's uh, apostleship. But nevertheless, they were to cut the strings to the legalism of Judaism and step into the gospel of grace. And uh, consequently then, we've been looking at the priesthood of Melchizedek, who was not a priest of Israel. He was not after the order of Aaron and the tribe of Levi, but rather he was a high priest of the Most High God, you remember, which we stressed, was the term for God of the whole human race and not just Israel. And so now we come to this whole idea that the law has to be put behind them and step out into grace. All right, let's start in verse 19 then for this afternoon. For the law, the law of Judaism, the Mosaic law, made nothing perfect. In other words, the law of Moses, as holy and as pure as it was from God's vantage point, 
so far as men were concerned, it was weak, it was beggarly, because no man could keep it. And so it was not perfect. It was not the final answer to man's dilemma. But, flip side, the bringing in of a better hope did. Did what? Make something perfect. Isn't it amazing what language can do? The law, as pure and holy as it was, didn't finish it for the human race. Nobody was saved by keeping the law, and we're going to see that in a moment. But the flip side was, now God has introduced something that is perfect, and it can't be improved on. Now, you remember what I said several weeks ago, and I've been sharing it over and over wherever I open the Word. Twice in Scripture, God did something so perfect that he couldn't add to it, he couldn't embellish it, he couldn't correct it, and so what did he do? He rested. What's the whole idea? Well, if something is perfect, what more can you do? And so you just leave it there. The first one, you remember, was at the end of creation. The last verse of Genesis 1 says, and everything was very good. There wasn't a thing that he could improve on those days of creation. You jump into chapter 2, and what did he do? He rested. Nothing more he could do. And then we have the second one, of course, when Hebrews tells us that after Christ had purged us from our sin by virtue of his death, burial, and resurrection, and when he had purged us from our sin, he did again. What? He sat down, denoting a finished work. He could rest. All right, so now this is what we're coming back to, see? The law wasn't perfect. It didn't finish it as Christ said he did. But the flip side is that now the bringing in of a better hope, that is, our gospel, based on his death, burial, and resurrection, it did. Did what? Made it perfect. So that there was nothing more that can be added. And isn't it sad? Oh, mankind has walked it underfoot ever since Paul the Apostle began to introduce it to the Gentile world. And he writes so pitifully, I think, in 2 Timothy. Oh, Timothy, you know that all those in Asia have turned against me. Why? They didn't like Paul's message. They preferred something that demanded works. And I was just reminded again, as I was reading last night, a quote from the president of Princeton University, and I used it, I think, when I started the Book of Romans, if I'm not mistaken. And I think I can quote it almost verbatim, and I called Princeton some time ago and found out when he reigned as president, and it was back in 1888. And uh, that, of course, gives rise to the truth of his statement, you know. He hasn't been polluted by the modernism of the last hundred years. But in... Uh, 1888, 1890, this president of Princeton made this statement. Either Christendom has to rehabilitate the doctrines of Paul, or it is on and on and on to apostasy and despair. And uh, the gentleman who quoted it in the book I was reading last night went on to say, isn't it sad? And of course he was writing in about 1910 or 1915, and he says, isn't it sad that Christendom chose the former? They chose to turn against the Apostle Paul and his doctrines and uh, went instead contrary to it. But whatever, we're not going to do that. We're going to hang with Paul's apostleship, with his teachings, and with his gospel of the grace of God. All right, so again, verse 19, for the law. The Mosaic system made nothing perfect. It had so much lacking. But this which came in later now is so much better, and it did make it perfect, and by the which we draw nigh unto God. All right, now just to prove the point, let's go back. I know many of you have been watching Romans being taught now during the weekday programs, but uh, come back with me to Romans chapter 3, because... We can never repeat some of these things often enough. I have to be constantly reminded by our letters that for most of our audience, they are hearing these things for the first time. And uh, you just can't, you can't grasp it in just one hearing. It has to be repeated. 
and repeated. So some of you who have been in my classes here in Oklahoma for 20 years, you'll just have to bear with me. You're going to hear it again. But remember that we have all kinds of people out there who are hearing it for the first time. All right, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. And this is exactly what Hebrews 7, 19 is referring to. That the law was not perfect. All right, here's why. Romans 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Well, now, what percentage of the human race, even at that time, was that applicable for? Well, the little tiny nation of Israel, which was probably just a fraction of a percent of the total, they were the only ones who were under the law. But on the other hand, to settle the sovereignty of God, the whole world came under the, the curse of the law, not just Israel, the whole world. And that's what it says next, see? We know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that is, to the nation of Israel, that every mouth, going beyond the nation of Israel to the whole human race, that every mouth may be stopped. What does that mean? Hey, when they come before God, they can't argue. Oh, they're going to try, I think, but it's not going to work. The Lord himself gave us a good example. He said in that day, and he was speaking of the great white throne, he said, in that day they'll say, but Lord, what does that mean? They're arguing. <laughs> but Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and all that? And what's his answer going to be? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Sad, isn't it? So sad. But nevertheless, the law could do nothing more than what we see in the rest of the verse now, that all the world not may become saved, as a lot of people today think yet, that if they just keep the commandments and do the best they can, then God will say, well, come on in. Uh -uh. All the law could do was condemn. Never saved anybody. Now, that shocks people who have never heard it before. But the law has never saved anybody. All the law can do is show man their sin. And the fact that we've all broken it. And so it is not a vehicle of salvation. It is a ministration of death. Because, as James says, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of how many? All of them. Boy, where does that leave all of us? <laughs> We're all lawbreakers supreme. See? All right, then the next verse, 20, still in Romans 3. Therefore, by the deeds or the keeping of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. Not Jews, not Gentiles. For by the law is only one thing. And what is it? The knowledge of sin. The law condemns. All right, I said already it was a ministration of death, and we're going to be looking at it in probably in chapter 8. But let's jump ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I think I used it maybe in one of the last programs, uh, in the last taping. I'm sure I did. But it bears repeating. And I'm going to use it, like I said, in the next chapter when we speak to the tables of stone that were in the Ark of the Covenant. I'll make some statements on that. That's so going to shock people. But here, since I've already alluded to it, let's read it a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. All got it? Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, or the New Covenant, not of the letter. Now, whenever Paul uses the letter, he's referring to the Mosaic Law. We're not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, the law, the written law, the ten, if you want to call it that, they can do nothing but kill. But the Spirit gives life. Now, maybe I should stop. I have probably made statements over the years that have shocked people, and, and only because they probably don't understand where I'm coming from. But when I say we're not under law, we're under grace, then the first impression people get is, well, he's telling me I can do whatever I want to do. No, no. The law, you see, demanded, whereas grace 
is total freedom, total liberty, but instead of the law telling us what we can't do and what we can do, we now have the indwelling Holy Spirit who changes our whole modus operandi so that we don't want to break the law. And what a difference, see? What a difference. And that's where Israel failed so miserably all up through her Old Testament history is that they were under those demands of the law but with no power of the Spirit to help them keep it. And so consequently, what were they doing most of the time? Breaking them. Breaking them, see? And uh, almost became despairing because they just couldn't help it. They didn't have that indwelling spirit. So always remember that when I say we're not under law, we're under grace, I'm not saying we've got license. I'm saying now we've got something that empowers us to keep God's law. All right, now then, verse 7. Here it comes. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, well, now listen, the average 12-year-old kid can tell you what that's talking about. What was engraven in stone? The ten. See? And what are they? They're a ministration of death. They don't give life. All they can do is condemn. All right, then verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stone was glorious, and it was, it was perfect from God's vantage point, now, if that was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory, of course, was to be done away when this whole new concept of grace would be brought in. Well, we could just keep going, but I think maybe we better make a little headway today. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 7, and uh, now we can go into verse 20. Hebrews 7, verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. Now verse 21. For those priests, that is the priests of Israel, out of the order of Aaron from the tribe of Levi, those priests were made without an oath. But this, this priesthood of Melchizedek, this uh, priesthood was made with an oath by him who said unto him, which of course is from God himself, the Lord swear and will not repent or change his mind. Thou, speaking of this priesthood of Melchizedek, of which Christ is the epitome, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And remember that was sworn in an oath from God himself. And nothing could settle it more that Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek by virtue of the oath of God based upon his person. All right, now then, verse 22. By so much, that is, by God swearing in an oath that Christ would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And the other word for testament, of course, is covenant. Now, I'm not going to comment on that word covenant in this verse because we're going to be picking it up again a little later in chapter 8, and I will enlarge on that. But we still have to realize now that we're coming out of one system and God is bringing in another. And of course, that's one reason there is so much confusion across Christendom. They will not separate these two entities so that it's simple and easy to understand. But the law has to be set aside. It's done. It was crucified at the cross. And God has ushered in now this whole new system or economy of grace. All right, now we're going to come back uh, in verse 23 and see what a difference between the priests of Israel and this priest, Jesus the Christ, after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 23, and they, the priests of Israel, truly 
were many. Well, that stands to reason. They had courses. In other words, they had regular schedules of all these numbers of priests as to when they would serve in the temple worship. And uh, then, of course, as the next verse says, or down a little further, they're going to die. And in their place will come up new young men, always filling the ranks of the priesthood to keep fulfilling all the ritual there at the temple. All right, and so they were many, but they were not permitted to continue because of what? Death. They were human. And when the old Grim Reaper knocked, they went just as soon as anybody else. And so their priesthood would end and a new one would come in. And then verse 24, what's the first word again? But, but, the flip side, we're not under that system of Israel's priests that would live and die and be replaced and die. No, we are under a whole new system. This man, now remember I pointed out, I think in our last taping, that Paul refers, in fact, we better go back and look at it. Let's read this verse and then we'll go back. But this man, this Jesus, the son, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, but this man, because he continueth ever. Now, you remember what we said about Melchizedek's priesthood last program? He was without beginning. He was without end. He's what? From eternity to eternity. And we always make the point, when we're saved forever, how long is that? For as long as God lasts. That's how long we're saved. We'll go on and on as long as God does. Quite a thought, isn't it? That's what it means to be saved forever. All right, so this man, because he continueth ever, his priesthood will never end. He will never die because he has an unchangeable priesthood. All right, now let's take us back to Timothy again. This is all review, I know. I haven't gotten senile yet. I know what I'm doing. But uh, I want people to see it over and over so that it will not be forgotten. And uh, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Yeah, 1 Timothy. Chapter 2, now let's just start at verse 3. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 3. We looked at this a program or two back when I made mention of the fact that Melchizedek appeared to Abram as a man. Christ is in the glory, interceding for us at the Father's right hand as a man. And here we have the scripture to back it up. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who, that is God, will have all men to be saved. Now that's not saying there will be. Only precious few will be, but that isn't God's fault. He's made it possible for every human being to spend eternity with him. But they won't because they refuse to take it by faith. But God's whole concept is that he has finished the work of salvation for all. For all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now here's the verse I want you to lock in. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who? The man Christ Jesus. See how plain that is? Now, I'm afraid there are a lot of even professing believers who do not comprehend that Christ is in glory ever since his ascension in human form. The disciples saw him go. He didn't suddenly change into the invisible. The scripture is so plain that he maintained his, his human appearance and he left in such a way the disciples could see him go. And Zacharias foretells the day that he'll return, and again it's in human form, because what does Zacharias say? And his feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. Now listen, the spirit and an invisible thing doesn't have feet. But he will, because he is bodily. 
at the Father's right hand. And again, now let's just go back a little further. Colossians, honey. Let's go all the way back to Colossians, chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Let's just start at verse 8 and 9. Start at verse 8, but verse 9 is the verse I want to show. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Beware. See, there's that constant warning from the pen of the apostle that we better keep our eyes on truth and not be led astray with all of this pseudo-truth that's being thrown at us, especially today. But it was already evident in Paul's day. So he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He has to be the very focal point of our whole belief system. Now here it comes, for in him in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. How? What does your Bible say? Bodily, not in spirit form, not invisible. My, when he took off from the Mount of Olives, he left bodily. How bodily was he? When he had fish cooking on the fire up there in Galilee, and the disciples had caught nothing all night and he asked the question do you have any food and they said no but what did he have cooking fish and bread and then Luke tells us plain as day not just the disciples ate but who Jesus ate he ate how don't expect me to tell you how he digested it but I know he ate and yet in that same body, he went into the glory. In that same body, he's coming again. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. He's going to rule and reign bodily. Not some invisible enigma, but the man Christ Jesus, who is the mediator between man and God. The man Christ Jesus, who sat down at the Father's right hand, having finished the work of of redemption. It was perfect. There wasn't one more thing that he could do. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.